This is Horror Podcast. Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm Michael David Wilson, and every episode, alongside my co-host Bob Pastorella, we chat with masters of horror about writing, life lessons, creativity, and much more. And today's guest is Danielle Tresoni for part two of our conversation. And Danielle is a New York Times, USA Today and Sunday Times top 10 best-selling novelist. She's been a Pulitzer Prize in fiction jurist and she writes the Dark Matters column for the New York Times book review. And in this second part of the conversation, we really delve into a number of your Patreon questions. We also talk about Danielle's Catholic upbringing, a religious and spiritual beliefs, and we talk about tips for writing that are specific for the horror genre. There's also bits on writing routine, on the writing process, and we even learn a little bit about the forthcoming book that Danielle is working on now. So before any of that, let us have a quick word from our sponsors. From best-selling horror author Lee Mountford comes the Supernatural Horror Collection. Three hugely popular novels in one box set. The Demonic, The Mark, and Forest of the Damned, together in one terrifying volume. Available in ebook and paperback, and a high-quality audiobook that is sure to get under your skin. Haunted houses, haunted forests, haunted people. Search Amazon and Audible now for the Supernatural Horror Collection. Don't just read horror, experience it. Water for Drowning by Ray Cluley, narrated by R.J. Bailey, is the brand new audiobook from This Is Horror. Including the British fantasy award winning story Shark Shark, dive in and download Water for Drowning by Ray Cluley on Audible today at bit.ly.com forward slash Water for Drowning in the US and bit.ly.com forward slash Water for Drowning UK in the UK. All right, with that said, here it is. It is the second part of the conversation with Danielle Tresoni on This Is Horror. Well, let's have a look at some Patreon questions. So we've got a number from Lucas Mill Iron. And the first, he would like to know, how do you find writing fiction and non-fiction differ? And do you have separate voices for each? Mm, so interesting. Such a great question. Um, I do tend to have different voices for each, I think. Let me think. I mean, the basic distinction is I don't write a lot of nonfiction that isn't about me. <laughs> you know, it's not like I write kind of general nonfiction. When I write nonfiction, especially as a book, it's a, a memoir. So it's about my life and it's about me. And so I have a more internal kind of um, introspective form I think when it comes to writing memoir and with fiction um I've I've really allowed fiction to be the place where my imagination can just go nuts um and so I let that happen in fiction um and I you know I think a lot of writers that I know anyway um start off writing fiction about themselves right they you know they start start a novel that is autobiographical in some way or is based on their life in some way and that overwhelms the imaginary parts of it or you know the the plot for example or the characters being really different from whoever is writing it and so i think you know for me 
making that split between memoir where that's where the autobiographical information really goes and then fiction that's where my imagination can play and you know although as we both you know as we've all said you know that you can see lots of connections between my fiction and my life you know the angelology you know angelology being connected to um this catholic upbringing and so on um but really they're very distinct in form I, I i like plot i guess i'll just you know boil it down in fiction i really like a plotted um um story that moves and has uh you know forward forward momentum and in my memoirs, although those are structured, you know, to it like a story, but they're they're not obviously like thrillers, <laughs> you know, they're not or horror, although, although that's debatable with you know with <laughs> right, but, right. Uh, but um, yeah, yeah, I think that that's the major distinction. Yeah, and as you mentioned your Catholic upbringing again, I mean, I actually wanted to ask how has that informed your beliefs today and i mean if you're thinking about religion and spirituality what would you say your personal beliefs are such an interesting and personal question um nobody's ever asked me that um so i think the the legacy of growing up catholic and going to church every day um has left me with a need, a very deep need for ritual. Um, and the sort of ritualization of a mass, of a Catholic mass, has left me with a real need to ritualize my my life. And so that actually, I had a, um, I, you know, maybe this might answer a future question <laughs> about <laughs> writing, about writing routine, because um, my writing routine very much mimics in some ways the kind of ritualization that I went through as a, a kid going to, to church um, six days a week in the morning. And, you know, now I wake up, at, you know, early every day and um, I, I write, you know, at very fixed hours and I do sort of strange things in my office, like the same rituals, like, you know, I... I set up my desk the way that the same, pretty much the same way every day. And I have um, like little habits that I do and all of that's very ritualized. But, um, you know, that's a kind of secular way of expressing this form. Um, but, you know, I also, I would say that I'm, I've become, you know, I've never said this before, but I think that I've become pretty much pagan. Mm. <laughs> you know, like I'm very much interested in, um the earth and earth rituals and you know the moon and um seasons and and grow you know sort of how we grow as biological creatures i'm interested in you know i don't know it's just um uh, it's kind of crazy but when i was writing the ancestor um i listened to a lot of um bjork <laughs> Right, <laughs> you know, the album I think it's Biomorphia. That's like all about like different biological accretions and growths, and um, you know, sort of natural movements. And I feel like that's where my spirituality has gone, very much in into the earth, into a very like sort of biological place if that makes any sense to you <laughs> it, it does yeah it does and i mean you said that you might be anticipating a question and indeed sadie hartman wants to know about writing routines so i mean as a follow-up to what you said you said you listened to a lot of bjork while writing the ancestor so do, do you tend to find that you have a kind of playlist or an artist per story that you're writing or does it vary depending on the mood so i mean how do you decide on the music that you're writing to well when i'm writing a first draft i can't listen to anything actually mm. it, or lately I, I i can't i used to be able to i used to listen to like for example with um angelopolis which is the second book in the angelology series i listened to the gold Berg variations like obsessively right because mm -hmm. um, I was interested in pacing and I wanted it to move very fast so that was like a conscious choice and and 
I, and I did was able to listen to a certain kind of music through writing that book. I don't know. Since then, I haven't been able to. Um, I listen to a lot of music, you know, in while I'm revising or when I'm thinking about the book. But when I'm actually writing now, it's just total silence. Um, but, you know, the Bjork that I was listening to, I would sometimes pause and, you know, put on my headphones and, and then, you know, play. You know, there was one song, Crystalline, that I played a lot. Um, and, yeah, I don't really – I kind of play around. I don't really choose anymore, like, to have one particular playlist or one artist. But I do listen to a lot of, you know um, – I, I like to get inspired, so I sort of play around and listen to a lot of different things. Mm. And you said that you have very fixed hours when you're writing. So I wonder, what are those fixed hours? And do you take it to another level where you might define, okay, I have to write for X amount of time before I can kind of get up and get another coffee or whatever it is you're drinking? Yeah, no, I don't do that. I, I, I'm at my desk about at about 7.30 every morning. Mm. Um, and I, 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 I mean, I can tell you, I drink three coffees between 7.30 and 12.30. <laughs> and when I get up and get them is up sort of however I'm feeling. Yeah. Um, I don't really, you know, set a certain amount of time. Um, and then I'll go and have lunch. And then the rest of the afternoon, generally till four, I'll either, there's a couple of, you know, I'll either revise what I was working on or I'll do social media or I'll answer emails or, you know, the, the sort of more external side <laughs> of the writing business, I guess. I don't know, the writing world. I, I don't know what to call it, actually. It's very interesting because, you know, when I wrote Angelology, as I said, I went away and didn't have to, didn't really do any of that. Um, but now I'm I'm very much involved in engaging with people, so it's made my day different. It's changed my my writing schedule. Mm, yeah, I mean, I guess there's loads of things we could term it from engagement, as you say, to admin, which makes it sound far more <laughs> mundane and boring. But I I suppose really you've got seven thirty till twelve thirty where you're writing, and then you've got post lunch until about 4 p.m. where you're doing writing tangential things. Right, exactly. And sometimes it's editing, you know, if I have something I have to turn in or, um, you know, so sometimes it, it is like me playing around in the text that I was writing. But most of the time, yeah, it's like, okay, I'm going to do social media and I'm going to write my newsletter and I'm going to answer email from from readers. And, you know, it's, a, it's all the same feeling the same universe that I'm in, you know, in my writing community, I guess. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's different than actually like struggling with, you know, with writing a draft, which yeah. is, you know, like <laughs> you've got to punch stuff out, punch out your, your word count for that day. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder, do you have any pagan or earth rituals that you do either daily or weekly that you kind of feel enhance or help with the writing process. I have an altar. Um, I have an altar in my office, and my I call my office the writing cave um, because it does feel very much like a cave sometimes. Um, but I have an altar, and I have, um, you know, I do various rituals. Um, at that altar, I actually have an ans it's an ancestral altar in some ways because I have photographs of ancestors and my father and and people who have been dear to me that have passed away and um, I have you know rocks that I li like I have all sorts of natural stuff on on this altar and um, you know yeah I, I I have various rituals that I do I I very much follow kind of the, the moon cycle <laughs> in some ways, you know, like the, when it's a new moon, like it is today, we're recording on a new moon. Um, it's a moment for me to sort of make plans for the month um, with my writing schedule and, and my goals for my writing schedule and, and also just um, re kind of resetting um, how I feel about about everything in some ways, you know, looking at it as a chance to let go of the things that frustrated me 
or even pleased me about the previous month and start again, right? Like that, I think that ability to, for me anyway, and I think for writers who survive more than one or two books, the ability to reinvent and to let things go and to start over is very useful. And so I kind of do that every month with, you know, on a new moon. And then, you know, I follow the quarters of the moon. Um, and then, you know, on a full moon, I, I like to see things come to completion. Obviously, you can't really time, you know, books or writing to come to completion, but I like to maybe look over what I've done and see if it's what I had intended to do, what I want, where I'm at. You know, it's very, I don't know, it's a way of structuring reality for me. I think that if you grow up in a religion the way that I did, like growing up Catholic, in the way that I did, meaning like I went to a Catholic school where nuns were teaching me in my classroom and I was in church every day. And um, you start to feel um, at home when you have um, your reality sort of ordered in a certain way. It doesn't necessarily have to be a spiritual way, but for me, I do feel much better when I can <laughs> put reality into some kind of pattern or order that makes sense to me. I have an, a, like an agenda or like a calendar that I write down, um, you know, what, what has happened that day. So in terms of like the word count for my writing or um, what I've, what I've done or, and how that reflects the sort of goals that I set out for myself earlier in the month. So um, for productivity, having that kind of orderly worldview about my days and months, it, it really helps because it keeps me on track. Yeah, and I think there's a lot to be said for planning and for having word counts. I mean, it is setting yourself up for success and it is um, almost ensuring that your future self has these kind of completed projects. So I, 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 I definitely relate to that and I tend to find if I don't plan to that meticulous level, then it I don't know, it's almost like getting in a car and driving around but having no real sense as to where I'm going and maybe I'll find a place that I'll enjoy but I'd much rather <laughs> have planned the route to begin with. Yeah, it's so like that. And, you know, you always hear people, like writers, talking about that a novel is writing, or writing a novel is like driving in the fog with your headlights on and you can only see just as far ahead as the as the lights will allow you in that fog like i've heard novel writing described like that and i think i started my career thinking of novel writing like that and now i'm absolutely on the opposite yeah. side of that i really think that if you write without planning where you're going or finding some orderly system to to structure your novel before you start writing or while you're writing even um, it's really time consuming and it's really a, you know, kind of a waste for, for, you know, that's where I'm at. I, I even have started doing like micro outlines, um, where I'll outline, like, for example, I'm writing a new novel now and, um, I'm, I have out an outline of the first like 150 pages. And that really helps me get the sort of beginning part done. I don't necessarily have to outline the whole book at this point, but I like to have small chunks of it outlined. Yeah. Right. To me, that's, I mean, I, and I've been writing for a long time and I started off, you know, writing without a net. And then I became very structured like you. How do you keep yourself from like losing momentum and steam after doing even like a micro outline? Because for me, I find that especially if it's a new idea I'm trying to develop, that if even doing a small, very easy outline, I, I lose interest in, in the project. Maybe it's not a strong enough idea, but the project I'm working on now. I have absolutely no notes on. I started it two weeks ago and I'm at 15,000 words. So, I mean, I'm kind of excited that I'm doing this without any type of outline. 
So I'll tell you so what I, mean, I do. You see what yeah. I'm saying? I mean. Yeah, I see what you're saying. And it sounds like something that happens with me too. But so what I do, I kind of trick myself. And what I do is I'll write my first draft or I'll write the scenes of a first draft by hand. I have a, you know, a certain type of paper I like and a certain type of pen and I have different colored inks and I'm very like, you know, crazy about like getting all of that, like exactly how I want it. Um, and I will write out all of the scenes that I'm, that are coming to my uh, imagination without that outline. And then I take, and I, it sounds like that's what you're doing, that you got 15,000 words. And for, for me, sometimes that it comes much faster and I have a lot, a bigger word count quicker, but then I take that and I like, this is what I'm doing right now is I have this mass of material um, that I'm now reading through and making the outline structure and moving scenes around and putting an outline so that I can move forward. Right. If that makes sense. So do, so, it oh, does. It does that way. So in other words, like you, you got <clears throat> a big chunk of the actual narrative down the scenes. And then when you start to put it into, to a, th you know, into actual format, then you're going to actually, you know, do, do an outline there. So that yeah, would keep yourself from losing any type of momentum. Yeah, and I do the outline. And this, in this case, in this one, I I, I knew sort of how it was going to begin and where it was going to go up into the middle. So I had a, like a rough sketch, and then I, mm -hmm. you know, quickly mm -hmm. sort of, you know, while I was inspired, wrote the pages. And then before I did like what I call the second draft is like typing it into a word processor, right, or a, a program mm -hmm. like Word or whatever. Before I do that. I make an outline from those scenes like right. and I see what's missing right because there's inevitably a lot missing um, in terms of story and I will make that outline plugging in the scenes I've already written and then realizing which scenes have to be written to put it together I mean this so is not sounds, a, like that's just what I'm doing right now yeah it sounds like to me that that you like the discovery process that that first draft you know, and, and, but you also like taking that and fleshing it out and possibly, you know, rearranging things and, and, and making it seem that way as well. Yeah. And I wouldn't do it with a whole book, right? Like the idea of just like writing scenes ad infinitum uh, and, you know, for 300 pages or 400 pages without having a structure in place, that would make me feel crazy. What I can do is like, you know, like what you said, 15,000 words, I think I did I think I did that with 25,000 words with this project. Like I wrote, I knew the general direction I wanted to go and wrote scenes out and, you know, sort of wrote in that direction and discovered the character and discovered mm -hmm. the, the setting and all that stuff. But then I stopped and, and went back and um, did the structural work. So I know where it's going. And then now I have, before I'm even going into the next part, I have an outline <laughs> of where yeah. that's going. So it's basically I, like discovering the world. Right, right. And it's and to me, I, I feel like and this is different, you know, because like for the last couple of years, I've, I've, you know, with the exception of short stories, I have, you know, uh, on longer projects, I have kind of mapped them out a little bit. Um, and it could be like, you know, like a, two words and for one chapter, you know, just to, to set a mood or something like that. And. To me, it's like I almost like, hey, I haven't written a single note about this. I haven't written anything. I'm like, I wonder how far I can go. But I have a feeling where I'm at now. I got two more scenes to do, and then I'm gonna have to do some structure. And it, that scares me because I'm so excited about just like, hey, I'm just like, I'm actually getting some word count done. Da 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 da. And I really like the voice, and I like the way this is going, and I don't want to lose that momentum. So I'm going to have, I'm going to have some big decisions. Yeah. It sounds like you, you will, but <laughs> it's be fun, right? Like this is the fun. It's fun. This is the other thing is that I, you know, when something gets tedious, I try to turn it into something fun. I'm continually figuring out ways to like trick myself into writing <laughs> and not giving up. Yeah, I don't want to be like uh, what's his name, uh, and he was—he's a great writer too, and he was great. And he, you know, I mean, uh, he is a, a great editor. T. E. D. Klein, and uh, he wrote the ceremonies, uh, which is uh, basically just a seminal horror novel that came out like early '80s, 
And uh, in an interview, he said he would do just about everything that he could think of to avoid writing. Yeah. And I'm like, you are so powerful. How can you do that? <laughs> but, I mean, for him, it was oh, a different it. thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. some people really hate it, right? Like, they, it's interesting to me because I actually – I like it. I like sitting down at my desk. I like writing. Um, I don't, I, I'm in a kind of painful part of the process right now where I have like, you know, 25,000 words that are just like in a pile on my desk, like of pages <laughs> and trying mm -hmm. to figure out how to put it all together. Like that's, that's painful, like making the outline, but actually the process of writing is something I love. Oh yeah. Yeah. To me, it's, it's that discovery phase. I mean, and I, it, I can edit just like, you know, I think I'm, I'm fairly good at editing. Um, I'm always one to have to add stuff instead of take out, though I'd love to be the other way around. It just seems like it's easier just to cut. Uh, but, I mean, you have to do what works for you, you know. Uh, my concept of overriding is is not near as, 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 as grand as some other writers. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's everyone has to figure out their own little um, methods, right? Like all the little mm -hmm. things that we do that keep us going. But the most important thing at the end of the day is that you're doing it. Yeah, I really do true. think that half of the battle is just showing up, right? <laughs> like mm -hmm. just being at, for me, just being at my desk, even if I'm not inspired to write something, I'm there and I'm going to be there until the time of day when I would leave. So I might as well write something since I'm there. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Well, I think it was Lawrence Block who said, I mean, he just ensured that he wrote a set number of pages per day, whether he did or didn't feel like writing. And, I mean, he gave himself permission that if at the end of the day he decided that his writing wasn't good enough, that he could tear it up. But he'd shown up. And, I mean, when you talk to writers about that kind of thing, it often manifests that when you look back at your writing, you can't actually tell which were the good and which were the bad days in terms of that mentality and mindset. Yeah, and if you really go deeply into it, you start to even forget things like which draft you did. You yeah. know, I know that that's crazy, but I was doing a, a call with a book club um, last night and we were talking about, I had cut, I was telling them, because they were saying, I wish your no novel had been longer. <laughs> and I said, well, my editor actually cut, wanted me to cut 100 pages. You know, we cut 100 pages out of the book um, before it was published. And they said, oh, tell us a scene that you cut. And I said, I can't remember. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I can't. And because it just becomes this kind of fluid movement of, you know, writing and rewriting and cutting and writing and and the the amount of words you write per day or the amount that you cut or what you keep and what you throw away becomes less important than the whole product right like it's much more important to me i don't there, there was a point in my career i think where i would have like really struggled against cutting 100 pages i really would have fought against it but I'm at the point in my career where the whole of the book, the, the entire novel is much more important than the individual pieces. And so when I saw that the novel would be better without that, those pages, it was gone and I, and I forgot them. So it's, you know, it's kind of important to be able to be in that fluidity. Yeah. Yeah. And I think even though it sounds pretty cliche i mean sometimes much like a, a sculpture to cut and to take away can mean that actually when you look at the overall product or the overall creation what you have is in fact more so you're taking away to create something more and even though it sounds like there's some sort of paradox i think often this can be how art works i agree mm -hmm. i think yeah, I think you really find out find what you have when you start subtracting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's like the director's cut, like of Alien. You know, the original film. Uh, I think Ridley said that he cut two scenes, added three, and the film's shorter, but it's better. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and he's like, and, and I remember seeing that at the beginning of the, of watching it. And he says, he goes, I made a shorter film. He goes, but I think I made a better film. It's a little tighter. 
And so you'll, you'll see a couple of differences. You'll see some extensions and you'll see some things that are a little shorter. He goes, but this is my vision and longer does it mean better. <laughs> I was like, yeah. oh, okay. So <laughs> like, if you think about it, that's why, like, I think of writing the first draft almost like shooting, shooting film, right? Like you, you need a lot of material for me. I need a lot of material so that I can cut from that. And, um, I tend to write long, you know, I'll write a 400 or 500 page draft and then go at it, <laughs> you know, start mm -hmm. cutting. but I need to have the, the material there to cut from. Otherwise I don't know. So, um, yeah, I mean, a part of it is just having the stamina and the, the desire to, to get it all, the, you know, sort of in front of you mm -hmm. to have the option. We've spoken a little bit about research, and Lucas Milliron has a second question. He'd like to know, what is the worst research rabbit hole that you've fallen into? Oh, my goodness. Um, worst. I don't know about worst, um, because I tend to like research, <laughs> and um, the books that I've written... Ten, I'm trying to think. Um, angelology, there was so much research. And I really got into, for a while, the the conspiracy theories surrounding the Nephilim. Um, if, you know, if you look this up, if you look some of, up some of the books online or on Amazon or whatever, um, there's a whole sort of, like, literature about the Nephilim being responsible for building the pyramids or... Um, you know, that they were aliens or, you know, all of the conspiracy theory stuff that you can imagine um, has been uh, attributed to the Nephilim. So I did get go down that rabbit hole and read a ton of books about um, about this. <laughs> and, you know, I, I think it probably helped inform my book. It, it isn't exactly in my book, but um, yeah, I think I would have to say that. Yeah. And I mean... Often you do find that you just need to read something to help inform rather than put it in the book. I mean, me and Bob have spoken about before how it, it's very cringe when you can kind of tell that somebody did this huge body of research and then just tried to shoehorn it almost like an info dump into the story when it doesn't serve the story. And I guess that that's the key, really, making sure that everything you write is serving the story and not the other way around. Yeah, for sure. It's the worst when you're, you're reading a book and there's like two pages of, of basically Wikipedia yeah. dumped yeah. <laughs> in the middle. Yeah, it's not. It's, it's really the. It's kind of a sign of of um, I don't know someone who's not very confident in their writing, right? So yeah, um, research. I like to do a lot of it, and then you know, like I you know, so many other parts of the process, I like to forget mm. and just see how it comes out. Yeah, and I think the terrible thing is if you're not that confident in your writing so you then over explain it can actually come across that you're being condescending to the reader or you're acting like the reader wouldn't have got that and it's like yeah i understood what <laughs> what you were saying it kind of reminds me of there's, there's a number of i guess very mainstream television shows where they'll just throw a flashback in to absolutely make sure you understand what has just been discovered but often it's like well i saw that part of the television show five minutes ago i do remember that happening you didn't need to flash <laughs> back to it yeah that's the worst i hate that <laughs> Well, Dan Markowski would like to know if you have any tips for writing that are specific to the horror genre. Ah, uh, um, well, so I, I don't know if you know this. I write the horror column for the book, New York Times Book Review. I do, and so yeah. I, yeah, I get a lot of new horror novels every month. Um, and I read a lot of horror, new horror. Um, and I'm much, I, I you know, I, I grew up reading horror and, you know, I, I kind of 
my worldview as far as books go were you know it was really formed by a lot of 1980s horror um so i love it um and i love new horror too um but you know i came to this genre at a kind of an angle which i think is good because it allows me to see it a, a little bit outside um and i would say you know and when i'm you know the book i'm writing now it's probably the most horror um, genre-esque novel I've ever written, the new one. And But I'm coming to it looking at the conventions and the tropes and the history of horror and really taking it and trying to make it mine. Um, so what I would say is, you know, know what the genre is, you know, know what's been done. Even just if you go, I mean, seriously, it sounds silly, but google horror tropes and just look at the you know 500 tropes that come up and and look look at those things when you know you're planning your story and then figure out how to make that particular horror story that's in the genre yours so it feels like it's you that that's what i would say i mean you don't want to copy somebody some somebody else's horror novel or style or any of that you really need I think to be within the tradition, but to be original. Mm, yeah, yeah. And how did you come to be writing the horror column for the New York Times? So an editor reached out to me and asked if I wanted to do it. It was as simple as that. It was really, um, I, I feel very lucky. Um, I was, you know, it's one of those things about, twi you know, people ask, do I really need to be on Twitter? To be, you know, I was on Twitter and, and this editor contacted me through Twitter. So, um, you know, she'd obviously read my books and knew that I was interested in the genre. Um, but yeah, so it, they asked me and I said, sure. Yeah. And I think in life, I mean, often it's good to just make ourselves available and receptive to new opportunities and it's amazing how if you kind of project that you will find that the these opportunities come to you and what, what a fantastic example of that i mean un unfortunately for people who are wondering about doing a similar thing there's not like a kind of easy takeaway that they can now replicate but it, it, yeah it, although if you yeah if you like to review horror there's lots of places to to review right yeah. you know there's and there's so many great horror reviews and websites um with reviews out there like sadie hartman who asked a question earlier um night she's an amazing reviewer and has you know the website nightworms um and so there's lots of places that aren't the new york times right you can start writing reviews elsewhere um and then maybe try to go to other places after yeah yeah and i think that's a, a good thing when it comes to goal setting or just looking into what are the things that i want to achieve what would make me happy to to try not to make them too specific so if i say i will only be happy if I am a reviewer for the New York Times, that is a very <laughs> narrow kind of net that I'm casting and and also seems quite dangerous for me to to kind of correlate my happiness with with a publication. And it might be, you know, that, that the editor doesn't get on with me or doesn't like me. So it would be a little bit silly for me to put too much happiness into achieving that. For sure. I think that, you know, just being what you said earlier about being open and receptive to opportunities and putting it out there and and um, and something will come. Um, the, you know, writing. But what I was going to also add about this column is that before I started writing this, um, no one really called me a horror writer. <laughs> it's interesting, right? Like how um, perceptions of how people read you and categorize you change when you start putting things out there. Angelology, um, while, you know, there is very much a sort of speculative fiction and horror element to it, it was never classified that. And it was ne no one ever talked to me about horror after those books were written. 
And the ancestor, while there, there's, you know, there are horror elements for sure, I would say is not completely 100% horror in the way that we think of it. There's suspense elements and there's historical fiction and that sort of thing in there too. So, um, uh, this is all just a sort of a long winded way to say that, you know, sometimes those things that come to you really help crystallize for yourself, like the path that you're taking. Like I realized when I started reading so much horror and reviewing it, um, you know, I remembered that how formative horror was in my reading experience as a, as a child. And, and it sort of pointed me in, in the right direction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it, was a similar thing for Elma Katsu. I mean, it was only when she wrote The Hunger about the Donner Party and about cannibalism that people started putting her into that horror category. Whereas, I mean, before, I, I guess you could say she'd written things that you might consider horror tangential, so paranormal romance and historical fiction and gothic fiction and dark fantasy, but then having written something that was so overtly horror, people then kind of retrospectively reclassified older fiction. And, I mean... At This Is Horror, we, we cast a very wide net when it comes to horror anyway. Mm -hmm. We're trying to to challenge that definition of horror. And, I mean, a lot of people ha have ran into readers who have said, oh, I don't read horror, but then their definition of what it is to write horror is so narrow that they're not including supernatural and gothic literature. So I, I think mm -hmm. horror right. is a lot wider than than perhaps the average person assumes it to be. I mean, people might just think of, of monsters and, and zombies and all of that kind of thing, which of course is horror but it's not <laughs> that's not all horror is mm -hmm. of course and yeah so, i mean that's it's so true i agree 100 percent. that's like what simon strances says that horror is a lens in which we view the world and we do cast a really really wide net and we're constantly challenging you know that's i mean i think that's why we're called this is horror <laughs> is because we're basically saying this is horror you know but it, it's it you can find it in so many places that you're not really looking. And it amazes me to see so many people that they read stuff. And I almost want to tell them who are sitting there telling you they don't read horror. And you're like, well, that was horror. <laughs> yeah. That, that book was horror. But, you know, you don't want to do that. You're kind of like, oh, well. But, like, and there's, I mean, it's like prime example. A great example with the Book of M by, uh, by Punk Shepard. We, we read that. To me, there's nothing more horrifying than everyone on the planet losing their shadow and causing the end of the world. So you can call it fantasy all day long, but for certain circles of people, that's horror. That's just plain old fashioned, nasty, dirty horror. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> horrifying, you know, <clears throat> and, and we yeah. do try to cast that wide net and it, it's, I, I would, to me, a book like Angel, I haven't read it, but reading the synopsis, having come from a religious background, I would see how that book could be horror. Because, you know, I mean, I remember, you know, reading in the past, and I don't really think that they explain this in the Bible, but I'm sure that I've read it somewhere in, in a theological text or something like that. But from what I understand, angels appeared to, to, to people in the Bible as fire because their true form would, would cause madness. It would cause, uh, you know, it was monstrous to the people, not that they were monsters, yeah. but it was something that they were, it was otherworldly, you know? Yeah. And so, and then, you know, when you, as soon as you said earlier that, you know, that, that Goliath was possibly, you know, this angel Hubert hybrid, then that, that kind of clicked in there. Because, you know, a lot of these, you know, they, they were supposed to be, you know, giants, basically, much, much larger than humans, you know. So I could see that how, how that could be. There, there's definitely a horror element there. Uh, but I can also see how a marketing team would go, well, it's not really horror. It's going to be this kind of supernatural suspense. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. And that's, I think, <laughs> you know, it's the marketing people. Um, right. Always that they're kind of, ruining everything. I know exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. we'd be in a, a genreless paradise without the marketing people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can see how you could conclude that they're ruining on on one hand, but on the other, as a writer, if they're going to ultimately mean that my book sells more copies, then I don't think I'll begrudge them that. I no, mean, of course, <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Of course. You know, the, the, the difficulty comes in when, you know, so for example, when The Ancestor came out, I've had many people um, say, oh, I don't exactly what what um, you were saying earlier. Oh, I don't like horror, but I love your book. Right. So it's that it's just the, what the categories are in people's minds. Mm -hmm. And that's the real problem. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, Bob was saying that. You know, there, there might be a book that people aren't classifying as horror, but it has horrifying elements in, therefore it is horror. And then other people will say, no, horrifying and horror are not the same thing. But I kind of feel when, <laughs> when we see these arguments, I think, well, let, let's dial it back a little bit. Did you enjoy the book? Was it a fucking good book? Mm -hmm. If yes, that is all that yeah. matters. That you know, are yeah. these good stories? You know, who 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 cares what genre it is? Did you have a good time? Okay, yes. Recommend it to people then. Mm -hmm. Read more of that. Yeah, yeah. The, the people that are like that, I don't really ha have any type of problem with that. It's the snotty ones who who won't read hard. They're like, oh, horror. Mm, yes. Yeah. The yeah. bottom of the barrel. You oh, know? They, as and we said, like, in, really? invariably they have red horror if you dig deep exactly. enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That that's one of my biggest um I, I find that one of the most annoying things about sort of the literary the so called literary community, that kind of snobbishness about genre certain genres. Right. I mean if something is well written and the story you know, grabs you and, and you, you read all the way through and you, you know, you're enjoying it, then it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, but there are people who are, I think, quite insecure about their relevance. <laughs> and so they have to define, like seriously, like defend and define what their genre is. Yeah. Yeah. And it, mm -hmm. it, it's a little silly when people try and say, oh, this isn't horror, it's literary. It's like, well, there's a great tradition of literary horror. It can be both, you know. Yeah. Where do you no, think Shirley Jackson and Mary Shelley <laughs> came from? Of do you course. not think they were doing literary horror? And I mean, exactly. your work is literary horror. Brian Evanson is literary horror. Stephen Graham Jones. Yeah, I love so, Brian Evanson. Yeah, <clears throat> Joyce Carol Oates. There's so many who who fit into that category where they are both literary and horror. Yep. Mm -hmm. And we love them. I yes. think that, you know, I love all of those writers. So um I think, you know, yeah, let's expand let's expand our our um our definition of horror. I think that's the the goal. And in my column that's what I constantly am trying to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um I'm I'm trying to bring in um you know, different kinds of, of writers and different kinds of horror writers or, you know, writers who wouldn't maybe classify themselves as horror. Yeah. <laughs> and I do it for them, you know, and, and maybe they don't like it. I don't know. But um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I'm constantly trying to undermine those ideas. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. And I, I love it. I love that you're doing that work. And I mean, it, it's so important. And yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. that th there are people who have who have written certain stories like A.M. Holmes and Mary Gateskill and even George Saunders, who I'd say there are arguments that some of what you're doing is horror. I mean, you, you don't see them going around and, and classifying as that. But I mean, particularly as I'm attracted to as as well as the supernatural more kind of real life horror i mean when you start expanding it to that almost everything is is open to having horror interpretations <laughs> yes exactly but, yeah i know human humanity is full of horror yeah, right yeah <laughs> and i mean realism what, 
Yeah, what what a time to to be talking about it in the midst of a a global pandemic. But I mean that this isn't that this is Corona show, so I'll, I'll shy away from that. <laughs> but I did want to to go back to what you said about your current work in progress. You said that it is the most horror book you've ever written. So please tell us what you can about that one. So I'm not going to talk much about it um, just because it's not, I'm a little superstitious and I want to get to a certain point before I start talking about the story. But um, yeah, it's sort of a classic horror horror story. (laughs) It's um, something that I think anyone reading it would recognize as a horror novel, not only because of the tone or the lens through which I'm looking at it, but um, also just the elements that happen there. It's very, it's very much, uh, you know, um, you know, Stephen King could have written this book. It's that kind of horror. It's, Mm. it's horror. (laughs) Totally horror. All right. All right. Yeah. I'm having so much fun and I love it. It's like really, um, really enjoyable and fun for me. Well, we look forward to digging deeper when it is about to be released and we can discuss it at greater length then. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Please do. Well, Shane Douglas Keane would like to know, what is the, the best way for a podcast to be able to get you on their show and uh, I'm, I'm sure that there's no kind of self-interest in that considering that Shane Douglas Keane is <laughs> is a co-host at Inkeist I'm sure it's just a, a hypothetical there <laughs> yeah totally hypothetical <laughs> yeah <laughs> I think that's a question for you guys right <laughs> well I mean he 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 wants to know I think that the best way to specifically get you on the show so yeah i thought like in general how does one get on a podcast i don't Uh, i don't know no no. speaking about you specifically yeah oh okay um just send me a message and i will be there i like i love going on podcasts i'm very much into audio as you guys know i had my 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 little writerly podcast for a couple of years and then our audio drama so yeah and please invite me and i will come yeah. There you go, Shane. Yeah. But he don't know that right now. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe that was disappointingly simple. Maybe Shane expected some sort of pagan ritual and he, he would summon yes, you actually, up and to the sacrifice. <laughs> I yeah. mean, I require a blood sacrifice before I come on your show. So <laughs> Okay. So blood must be spilt, Shane. <laughs> <Blood>. <laughs> We're well, t- talking about your writerly podcast. I mean, the, the last episode that you put out was the end of August last year. Are, are there any plans to resurrect it? Or do you think that is a chapter of your life that is now over? Yeah, it might be a chapter of my life that's over. The My my co-host couldn't could no longer do it um, with me. And I just didn't want to do all of it alone. Um, so I decided to sort of close the door on that. I mean, maybe one day I'll revive it if I have an abundance of energy and, and time, but right now I I would rather, I wanted, you know, the audio drama we did was much more important to me and being able to, to write, you know, as much as I am is really important. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I guess this is the thing that we only have a finite amount of time. So we have to prioritize what it is we're doing. And whilst, you know, writerly was a positive experience, uh, as I often say, you can do anything you want, but you can't do everything you want. So tough decisions have to be made. Yep, unfortunately. So, you know, I, I think that that is a chapter in my life that's over. Although I'm going to keep them up for people who want, you know, there is a lot of information for people who are just starting out in the writing world. And so I think that people are still listening, you know, new people are coming to it. It's just not developing Yeah. beyond. 
Well, thank you so much for spending the majority of your evening chatting with us. This has been a lot of fun and we look forward to doing it again when your most horror novel comes out. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. it's coming. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's coming. <laughs> mm -hmm. I know, I've piqued your interest. I guess that that's good, right? Have people wondering. Um, well, and so if people, if anyone listening wants updates about that, about the novel that's coming or about anything else, just get in touch with me through my website. It's just danielletrasoni.com. Um, and I have a newsletter that I send out with, you know, recommendations for horror novels and information about things like Crypto Z or other other projects that I'm working on. So um, sign up for that and be in touch with me. And um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you guys for having me on. All right. Mm -hmm. Do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to leave our listeners with? You know, I just kind of want to go back to what um, you guys were saying about what horror is. And just I hope that people take that with them, that, you know, this idea of ghettoizing or marginalizing horror writing into like a certain category is is kind of just past, right? Like that's just so passe and it feels like something that it isn't the future of where horror is going. So keep an open mind, read lots and um, recommend lots of books and be proud to be in the horror genre. Thank you so much for listening to the conversation with Danielle Trasoni. Join us again next time when we will be chatting with Todd Keesling. But if you want to get that ahead of the crowd, if you want to get every episode ahead of the crowd, if you want to submit questions to forthcoming guests like Mackenzie Kira, Eden Royce, Sarah Pinbra, Adam Cesar, and many, many more, then become our patron at patreon.com forward slash this is horror. And if we re reach 200 patrons by the end of the month, then in August we will be putting out two episodes every single week. So it'll be a wild summer of this is horror podcasting. It'll be a lot of sweet horror fiction content. And all you need to do to help make that happen is become a patron at patreon.com forward slash this is horror okay before i wrap up quick word from our sponsors water for drowning by ray cluley narrated by rj bailey is the brand new audiobook from this is horror including the british fantasy award-winning story shark shark Dive in and download Water for Drowning by Ray Cluley on Audible today at bit.ly.com forward slash water for drowning in the U.S. and bit.ly.com forward slash water for drowning U.K. in the U.K. From best-selling horror author Lee Mountford comes the Supernatural Horror Collection. Three hugely popular novels in one box set. The Demonic, The Mark, and Forest of the Damned together in one terrifying volume. Available in ebook and paperback, and a high quality audiobook that is sure to get under your skin. Haunted houses, haunted forests, haunted people. Search Amazon and Audible now for the Supernatural Horror Collection. Don't just read horror, experience it. Now, there is another way that you can support the show completely free of charge, and that is to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And we have a new review on Apple Podcasts USA. And that is from Twerkins. And it says, A must listen. Penetrating interviews with absolutely everyone. I get turned on to so much new horror from this show. Don't miss this show. Well worth your time. So thank you to Twerkins and... If you want to leave a review, if you have yet to do so, then Apple Podcasts is a place to go. As always, I would like to finish with a quote. And this is a little something from Mark Twain to ponder. 
A successful book is not made of what is in it, but what is left out of it. I'll see you in the next episode with Todd Kiesling. But until then, take care of yourselves, be good to one another, read horror, keep on writing, and have a great, great day. This is Horror Podcast.